What's up? Right now we're here with Brianna White and Daniel Miraval, certified arborists. We're actually in Clarkston, Michigan. They're based out of Chicago with Emerald Tree Care. They're literally trimming an emerald ash tree. And bro, I'm gonna hand it over to both of them to talk about who they are, what they do, and why it's so important to get educated and become a green collar. What? Professional. Professional. Let's get it. What? So, Brianna. Yes. Who are you guys? What do you do? Why do you do it? Why are we here? Sure. Um, so like you said, I'm a certified arborist. I kind of specialize in the plant healthcare realm. So I like to tell people I'm like a tree doctor. Why is my tree sick? Why is it underperforming? What can I do to make it better? Um, and so for this ash tree, we've been treating this tree now for about 20 years. Um, it's doing quite well, but it needed that little extra level of care. So it's um, Daniel has prescribed a pruning prescription. Yeah, There's... it's a little bit more than just the deadwood. We're yep. trying to prune the tree for structure. There used to be two other adjacent trees, um, one on either side, um, but uh, they succumbed to emerald ash borer many, many years ago, so they were removed and this one uh, stayed around, uh, but it's never really had you know, the right kind of pruning that it's needed, uh, not just for deadwood, but for structural reasons as well. Um, but the tree's been compromised a little bit by intense shade from those other trees over the years yeah. and then none of that was managed so there's some dead spots in the tree ash don't like shade even for themselves so if they get too full they can shade themselves out and they have a lot of dead wood in there so we're trying to we're trying to stop um, the tree from continuing to lion's tail itself so lion's tailing is uh think of a lion's tail it's it's you know it's just smooth and then at the end you have a tuft of fur well in the tree it's smooth branch and then all the growth is at the end and you don't ever want that because for storm damage reasons uh, you get winds that come in they grab those branches and they just whip them around that's how you get breakage but because the tree hasn't been pruned um, professionally in a very very time, in a yeah. very very long time um, it's kind of lion's tailed itself so um, for the real tree guys that watch this I'm sure there's gonna be video and footage and you're gonna see um, some pretty some pretty bare branches but I've tried to do some crown reduction we try to offset that and hopefully the tree will flush back out and things will be great. So what actually happens with the emerald ash borer? It's an insect? Yeah, borer. A beetle? What is it? Yep, so it's uh, it's in the beetle family. It's in the agrillus beetle family. Um, it's, a, it's a foreign insect that bothers our native trees. So our Fraxinus americana, um, so green ash, white ash, red ash, blue ash, and black ash are pretty common in the area. Uh, green and white being the two most common. And um, we brought this insect over to America through the theory is pallets um, from China, kind of when the trade embargo was lifted, we brought in a lot of problems with it. And uh, the emerald ash borer was first confirmed in Michigan in 2002. And um, we've just been treating ever since. Um, but what the beetle does itself is it gets under, under the bark and it kind of feeds in like a serpentine shape, like that S shape. And I always tell people, if you think of an insect um, pruning, I'm sorry, eating about a business <coughs> card size underneath the bark, so it's doing this damage. So if you can imagine though, back at peak, here we go, back at peak time, oh, wow. so like this is an open wound. Like, so this would have been feeding way back when there was an insect and the tree doesn't like that, so it can't uh, form new tissue here. So this is a split, but this is reaction wood around that split. So the tree was trying to seal the best that it could. But imagine, you know, hundreds of these in a tree when it was first being hit with the emerald ash borer. Hundreds. At peak populations, it would be have, it would be safe to say thousands, but we're way past that peak population point. So. Yep, we still, we still treat just to make sure that nothing is in the area. Yep, here's a better, here's a better S gallery. That's more how they feed underneath uh, the bark. See the galleries in there where they go back and forth, yep. the fourth like serpentine, mm -hmm. and they cause all this damage. So what is it, one, one emerald ash borer can... Eat about a business card size. That's my, that's my image. That's a lot. Yeah. So it's a problem because it disrupts the, the, I guess you call it the vascular flow mm -hmm. of the tree. So the tree's ability um, to uptake water, nutrients, and all that back to the roots. So that and causes then, problems. Yep, and anyone that has their trees under treatment, any sort of systemic treatment, it's interrupted there too. So a lot of people say um, the ash trees are gonna die anyway. That's not true. Um, under care and treatment, 
they should thrive and be all right, but they're gonna need continued care. The insect isn't going anywhere, just like Dutch elm disease. If you have an American elm that you care about, that's something that's always gonna have to be treated. They're always gonna be under threat. Uh, ash trees are always gonna be under threat, but they, that threat can be managed. I think that's the biggest thing is understanding in tree care. A lot of what we do is management. Um, that's, I, think, I think that's the biggest takeaway that anyone could take away from this, is tree care is really about managing trees. You know, in the woods, they kind of take care of themselves. They are all very close together. They, um, they self prune each other. They protect each other from the wind. They share important resources underground. Um, as far as nutrient resources, they can share them between each other. But you know, this lonely ash tree in this backyard, kind of all by itself, is kind of is, is a setter individual than you might think it might be. It would love to be out in the woods with its friends, but it's not. Mm. Bro, so management. what about most people that, let's say landscapers that are just getting into tree care or guys that are just going around cutting down trees that don't know any of this stuff, where can they go to get educated and learn more? So one, that they're not causing damage or harm to people's properties, like learning how to be safe, but so they can become a green collar. Professional. Professional. <laughs> Well, I think it really starts with, you know, identifying your, your core values. What do you want to do? You know, if you want to be a person that removes trees, you know, why are you removing the trees? Every time someone calls us, we always ask, you know, why do you want to remove the tree? We don't just rush out there to go remove the tree. Um, some people are tree poachers. You know, that's how they make their living. Oh, Real quick, and this guy's told me some scary stories. I'll put links in the description below, like stuff that you actually need to hear. Just watch the videos of him. All right, keep going. Um, there are tree poachers out there that don't know any better and they just, you know, their prescription is just cut the tree down. Basil prune, as we call it, you know, down to the bottom. Um, and sometimes we do need to do that. Trees can be unsafe. They can pose significant hazards to life, property. They could be an invasive- Sometimes to other trees. Uh, sometimes to other trees. You have an, an invasive species of tree that's been allowed to get really big and it can fall down on a high value tree. So you want to, again, management, you want to manage the tree population. And that's what we do, we manage. So um, identifying your core values though, understanding if you want to be, you know, what side do you want to be on? You want to be on the preservation side. There's a lot of education that needs to happen on that side. You want to be on the removal side. There's even probably just as much, if not more education on that side. Removing trees is an incredibly dangerous um, job and hats off to the guys who do that. We don't take the trees down this big. I've never taken anything down myself bigger than about 20 inch uh, diameter uh, inch tree it's just I don't I don't have the stomach for it and I don't have the skill set for it and that's not how I started in the green industry and that's not really the little lane I wanted to go in so yeah identifying your core values knowing where you want to be on that spectrum um, of providing care for trees is really important and then do it as safely as possible and the two best places the well the best place to start would probably be the tree care industry association um, TCIA. You can go to TCIA.org, I believe is their website. And that's more like the, how do you build a tree care business? How do you, how do you do it safely? How do you build culture in a company? And all the things that you talk about in your videos, right? Like how, how do you build culture in, inside your organization and have it thrive? That's kind of where you want to start right there. There's a lot of focus on safety through TCIA as well, which if you end up going the removal route is a great place to learn how to be safe when you do what you do. Sure. Um, and then if you want to get, you know, more like on the tree doctor side, I'd, I'd call it, um, where you're more like a diagnostician. Um, you want to go through the International Society of Arboriculture and start that pathway towards becoming uh, a certified arborist. Mm. So you can become a, a, a proactive steward of, of the, the urban, urban environment. environment. Yeah, <laughs> the urban built environment. <laughs> It's incredible, and they're locking down like huge contracts with like entire like like malls and huge, like doing stuff that the average tree person doesn't have the knowledge or access to do. They're getting in locking down huge contracts, so there's a lot of um, opportunity. Yeah, people are starting to understand that their tree uh, populations have value. So that's something that Brianna and I know how to do. We know how to- Especially when they see a, an investment starting to, mm -hmm. like trees are dying or like what's going on, right? For sure, yeah. So, especially those threatened by invasive insects like the emerald um, ash borer, two ash trees. Um, and there's a few other trees that are susceptible to foreign pests as well. So managing those and preserving and protecting them. Again, this tree has been around for quite some time. And if they were to lose this tree, that would be all three that they've lost because they already lost two. Um, this one's not going anywhere, um, not under our watch anyway. But yeah, you know, they're, they're an older client 
and uh, they want to preserve and protect what they have. Now they've got grandkids, so they want the grandkids. The grandkids come over on the weekends. Great grandkids are out here playing in the yard. You know, they, their kids were able to enjoy the shade of the tree. So it's like a multi generational thing. So I actually feel bad at my own house. We have a. Uh we had a huge tree and it was dangerous. It was filled with carpenter ants and a very nice elderly na neighbor lady who's like 97. Like, dude, this tree was dangerous. She says, but my, my husband planted that in 1964. And I was like, mm -hmm. but this thing was dangerous, bro. But there's so much sentimental attachment that people are unwilling to invest. Sure. To save a tree, right? So like bro, Bri Brianna and I and uh, Charlie, who's in the tree in front, we're all tree risk assessment qualified through the International Society of Arboriculture. So we look at trees and try to assess them for their hazards. But then what can we do about the hazards? Can we mitigate you know, the risks that those trees pose? And then we have to properly communicate that to the client um, so that we make sure that they understand the mitigation options that we wanna provide for the tree, for them, uh, and that they're comfortable with those mitigation options. They have to have some level of access, you know, a threshold, an accessible threshold um, yeah. for what they can tolerate as far as risk and danger. Mm. Yeah. So what do you, actually I got another question. Uh, what do you, uh, you both specialize in and that now you come together and you, you merged, like what are the different specialties? My specialty is pruning. Um, especially um, restoration pruning. So trees that have been damaged in storms, um, just because a tree has been damaged in a storm, even significant damage, that doesn't always mean that the tree has to be removed. Um, dependent, there's a lot of mitigating factors involved in that, but you can often take that tree and you can restore that crown, restore the health. The tree may never look like it did before, but the tree is still a viable candidate for preservation. Um, that and then soil, anything to do with roots because of my many years um, in the nursery industry when I owned a high volume production uh, tree harvesting business for nurseries. We dig uh, many uh, 50, 60,000 uh, bold and burlap trees every year for different nurseries on the East Coast. So I know a lot about what goes on under the ground. So I always say, uh, like my friends from the American uh, Biochair Company, they always say the, the uh, beauty above comes from the science below. So that is very much true. Yeah. And then I would focus more on like the plant health care side. So um, diagnosing what is causing a lack of vigor in a tree, insects, diseases, and then abiotics, which is anything like environmental. So nutrient deficiencies, grade changes, um, a lot of times plant material next to new foundations, like new builds will per underperform just because of the fact that you've got um, your pH balance is upset you. because you've got <laughs> foundations, concrete yes. foundations, block leaching foundations that are leaching, the changing um, the acidity level of the soil. So a lot of times foundation plants aren't doing well. Uh, there's a lot of clay around foundations. Plants are sitting in water. So everything does okay for the first couple of years when it's new, and all of a sudden it starts to go downhill. Yeah. So. so a lot of times the environmental factors will play directly into Daniel's root assessment of how a tree is doing. So that's, I guess, how it all comes together. So you're, you, you focus more on the landscape community and how you, can, how you can help the landscape community. And I started in the landscape community. I think one of the best things that you can do if you're, if you're a landscape professional is understand the requirements that plants have. You know, don't just like make this basic design, throw all these plants in a, you know, all, all over random and then leave and, you know, um, not understand what's Black happening. Check and on the, yeah, you don't want to dip just like that when you check, right? If you're trying to be a professional, you want to add other services. You can increase your warranty periods by two, three years. You know, most people, we give one year warranty, but you can go three years if you understand the requirements of a tree and then you can set yourself apart from your competition. You know, so you need to understand some very basics. So even if you don't want to become an arborist, understanding plants and trees and their needs and their requirements, which is part of being an arborist, um, that'll help you a lot if you're a landscape professional. You don't ever have to leave the ground and get up into the tree, honestly. But you can learn all the things. I, I, I did not start my career in the tree. You have probably climbed a whole lot more than me, I would imagine, because um, you've, you've done a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but like we're more boots on the ground, focusing on what we can uh, manage you know, right close to the ground. Feeling overwhelmed, stressed out, bogged down, 
I know how you feel. I've been running my landscaping business 13 years, and one of the number one things that helped me was Jobber software. It freed up so much time because everything became digital on my phone. Billing, invoicing, payment collection, you could do it all with Jobber. If you wanna try a totally free trial of Jobber software for two weeks and get a huge discount with my exclusive link, go to getjobber.com slash Just go there and click the link below. Try it, you'll love it.